Well, I'm going to uh, get us started with a, a brief um, meditation. And for people who are just coming here for the first time, um, it is always okay to join whenever you get here. There's no, um, you know, I, I, I just feel people's lives are really complicated and whenever they can come online, they are really welcome to come online. And also, as you have comments, um, don't hesitate to sort of unmute yourself and jump in. So we'll begin just with a, a 10 minute um, meditation just to help ourselves arrive. So let this be an invitation to bring every part of yourself into this virtual room. Nothing needs to be excluded. Everything is welcome. And you can take this time to do whatever sort of grounding or settling practice is most supportive. For some people, it might be just settling with the breath, being present with the in-breath, the out-breath, accepting on the in-breath, letting go on the out-breath. Other persons may find some sort of, of Brahma most stabilizing, connecting with that intention to abandon ill will, to act with non-harming toward ourselves or with others. people do a body scan. And some people just softly internally chant. As Mark has noted in the past, sometimes the mind is really happy when it's chanting. And that's another way just to stabilize. So just take this time to feel welcomed and to just arrive with as much stability and curiosity as you can.
I'm really happy to see you all here this evening. Thank you for, for being here. Um, for people who are joining us for the first time, um, I just want you to know it's always okay to arrive whenever you do. And also, um, although it's probably helpful to keep yourself mostly muted um, when I'm talking right now, feel free to unmute and jump in if you have a question or a comment. So. I really encourage you to um, to grab me, and then we'll there will be more discussion after I make some um, initial kinds of remarks. So last week we looked at the pyramid, uh, uh, the pyramid of wisdom, which is really about investigation and discernment and seeing the three characteristics. Um, of uh, dis-ease, of impermanence, of um, what's called sometimes not self or the impersonality of experience. Seeing that um, in our, our daily lives more clearly and seeing that as the foundation for um, really understanding how it is that we're suffering right now. Um, Ruth King, the wonderful um, teacher and author of Mindful of Race said, you know, everything is always imperfect, impermanent, impersonal. And I often just remind myself of that through the day to say, okay, it's imperfect, impermanent, impersonal. And um, our uh, next pyramid, which is Viria, builds on wisdom. Virya is most commonly translated as energy. And I think that's a totally um, inadequate uh, translation and, and very misleading in a way. The root of Virya um, comes from Vira, which is, is man, and literally in Pali, Virya means um, manliness, virility, heroism. It's, it's um, you know, from a gender perspective, we might think that it's very unbalanced, but it's that sort of heroic energy in a way. And some people uh, have translated this as exertion, that Virya is the quality of um, exertion, particularly exertion in mental development. But what's interesting to me is that uh, Joseph Goldstein said, you know, it can also be translated as courage, courage in facing what is difficult, particularly um, in, in really coming to um, to see what the qualities of our mind are and really working with those in, uh, in a way that has, he, he even used the term valor. It's, doing, it's the quality that helps us do what is right despite the hardships in terms of um, sort of cultivating our own mental landscape. And I was really thrilled when I found that Joseph talked about it this way because about two years ago, my dear friend, Ayo Yuntundi, who some of you know, who have been to Common Ground, who has, um, she's now, much to my brokenheartedness, moved to Chicago, but um, she, she is a member of Common Ground. And Ayo, a couple of years ago, said to me that she said, you know, why is it that courage isn't a Buddhist virtue? You know, there are all these great virtues, and where is courage in uh, in the Pantheon. 
so I was very interested that Joseph said, you know, this is a, a cultivation of the heart and mind, and it's about exertion, kind of really making um, this this effort to confront what is difficulty <clears throat> difficult with some some valor. Usually, um, this parami is taught in conjunction with the sixth step of the Eightfold Path, which is right effort. And in that, it is about um, preventing unwholesome states of mind that have not arisen from arising, abandoning unwholesome states of mind that have arisen, cultivating wholesome states of mind that have not yet arisen, and um, stabilizing or sustaining wholesome states of mind that have arisen. And I think this is kind of the um, gardener view of our mental landscape. You know, you sort of don't let the weeds grow, you get rid of the weeds, you um, plant what you want, and you sustain it. And you know, in, in some sense, it's a very um, neat way of looking at um, sort of our, our states of mind, but I think it has some, some real limitations and some real dangers. When we talk about wholesome states of mind or unwholesome states of mind, anything that kind of grows out of um, you know, greed or aversion or delusion is unwholesome. And states of mind that are not affected by greed or aversion or delusion are wholesome. And you know, there may be a spectrum of um, how wholesome something is or not. I, I think one of the things that, that troubles me sometimes about this model in this sort of way is that it encourages, I, I think sometimes, a sort of spiritual bypass where we have a really difficult, um, really complex, um, state of mind. And what we do is that we decide it's unwholesome because it's fraught with delusion or we can see some really difficult characteristics with it. So what we do is just abandon it by skillful distraction instead of working with the, the uns, you know, working with the difficulty. So I want to say two things about this. One, sometimes, like when I have some sort of recurrent, um, you know, just getting on my blaming state of mind about something in politics or something someone said, and I just kind of trot that out again and just, you know, let it uh, be a tenant in my mind for a bit. You know, that's the kind of thing that I think. I just need to drop it, abandon it, get rid of it. And actually, the metaphor that I use um, for myself is I just say gutter ball. Because I know once I start on that, start going down that path about, um, you know, this tweet or what I heard or what was said, you know, I just, I just know there's, there's no way that's ever going to end up with a wholesome thought. But there are times when we have um, have thoughts and they're complicated and they're messy and they're um, they're just challenging states of mind. And I think that that the temptation just to distract ourselves from them, to let go of them is really what is involved in spiritual bypassing. I mean, you can see this around, um, you know, for exa example, issues of, of racism, issues of, of white privilege, stuff where we, we are just, I'll speak myself, there's this, this kind of uh, difficulty around things, difficulty with clarity, and you know, the 
the impulse to abandon them, I think sometimes is really unskillful instead of bringing our mindfulness and bringing this sense of virya, this sense of really bringing in an energy to kind of unpacking some of um, some of what is uh, is occupying our our mental landscape in difficult situations. Virya is um, what meets the difficulty, and and. I, so the the sort of traditional way of sort of uh, abandoning suppressing i i think there are um clearly times when that is appropriate i also think sometimes we i know i have just said okay this is an unwholesome mental state you know i'm just going to bring my attention to something else instead of ha having the commitment to seeing through this difficult situation, to working with my own delusion, to working with my own confusion. And sometimes, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's very hard to look into my own attitudes, my own, own stories. You know, what we want to do with Viria is to look at the difficult situations, be energized by the challenge, um, and to face these challenges with courage. And um, right now, because we're all living um, with the pandemic, in the pandemic, we're all making lots of choices about what's appropriate, what's not appropriate for each of us, how we're going to relate to other people. You know, are we going to form a COVID pod? Um, are we, you know, what, what is, what is really our understanding of what's, of what's going on? And certainly we bring wisdom to that, but we also bring this sort of, of energy that, um, that really stays with this, that we look into our own attitudes, um, or the stories that we're telling ourselves about the pandemic the stories we're telling ourselves about the reckoning going on in, in our cities and in our country. And we really are called upon to have some courage to address these difficult states of mind and these difficult issues and not simply do the spiritual bypass of saying, well, this may be unskillful, so I'm just going to abandon it. Uh, you know, in our daily lives, um, we're really called upon to work with these kinds of, um, of difficulties. And one question we can just ask ourselves is kind of like, what is my default state? You know, where is, uh, where is the mind? Utejanea talks about this quite a bit, you know, where is the mind resting? What is the mind doing? And can we bring a kind of um, valor, in a way, to really looking at um, what's going on in, uh, in the mind? There was some, um, I was talking with some other people this week, um, Dharma friends, who are very involved in anti-racism work, want to be really, and, and really, um, looking very critically um, with a lot, of, a, a lot of, of interest, but really looking at our impulse to help. Um, you know, the, the idea that um, in the, the white frame, many white people see themselves primarily as helpers. You know, that's what that's what we do. We help out. We help. And in some ways, that is a really great quality. And in other ways, having the identity, clinging to the identity of the helper, the good white person, the helper, um, is, can be a, a way of, 
um, centralizing ourselves, and, you know, taking up space on, on the state. And it's really hard to know what the appropriate action is. And, um, you know, in, in Zen, and I've mentioned this before, you know, they said, what is the, what is the essence of Zen? And they say appropriate response. And this is really a challenge for us in, in so many ways, whether it's about the pandemic and how we are relating to other people in this, the choices we make, um, the, um, the sort of um, shaming. Of, I mean, just, you, you can just watch all these sorts of, of responses when we really bring our, our interest to this. And it takes some courage to really stick with the difficulties um, and all the unknowns. And you know, Mark is always talking about the messiness of things. And to really bring this sort of um, courage. And because um, Sylvia Borstein said, you know, we take this parami to heart when we realize there is no other time but this one. And she said, this is the, uh, the parami that is about the willingness to stay with what is. It's not just about kind of, you know, cleaning up the, the mental garden and making it a, a very pleasant place to be. It is really in our lives, sticking with the difficulties of, uh, of the situations that we find ourselves in. Um, the, the difficulties civically um, and uh, you know, the difficulties in our um, relations with other, other people and the way we also kind of understand ourselves. So uh, I encourage us all to, to really think this week about this idea of uh, very as, as a kind of, of courage to be with the way things are and the way is you know, constantly moving. As, as Mark is always pointing out, everything is always moving. So we're back to sort of our, our impermanence. But it is, um, it is a, a virtue that um, encourages us to, to really be willing to sit with the difficulty. And the difficulty often is a difficulty of not knowing, you know, of, of, um, of not knowing. And again, here, when I, I, the difficulty of not knowing, and in some of the training I've done with Ker Terry Karras, so it says, you know, one of the things that many white people say, and they say from their heart, they say, I just don't know enough yet. I just, I need, I need to, I need to read, I need to do things. And of course we should all be reading and learning, but how often um, that is used because we are afraid to take a stand or afraid to, to move. And my experience in, in a lot of this, and especially around um, anti-racism work, is the way I have learned is by making mistakes. You know, the way I, I, I those have been my, my biggest learning experiences. And that sort of fragility of, you know, we, we don't want to harm. We don't want to harm ourselves. We don't want to harm others. But if we never, um, act boldly. If we never act, we just stay in the state of uh, a kind of, of paralysis. And it's like doing a spiritual bypass. So I encourage us all to work with courage, to be willing to face and, and that whenever, um, oh, I can't remember who said this. I heard someone quote this this week. Someone said, um, about doing something. And they said, well, I either win or I learn. I mean, there's no, there's no losing in what this person was doing. Either you know, I get it, I do it, or, or I learn. And if we could take that, that attitude, if we could have the courage just to say, you know, we're learning, we're learning all the time, and to also appreciate that we're doing the best we can, to really 
take that to heart too, to have a lot of kindness toward ourselves in, in doing this. I mean, I, I find that, that doing a lot of Brahma Vihara practice is what's really balancing for me um, at this time to do a lot of metta practice, to do a lot of compassion practice, and to really you know, include myself in all that and then to just extend it out. So that's um, primarily the sort of, of encouragement I wanted to give us this week in trying to work with Viria. And I would be really happy for people's um, observations and comments and ideas about working with this, or of course, questions too. So just um, unmute yourself and chime in. Patrice, um, when you talk about courage, I'm reminded of the term warrior that's used a lot in Shambhala. And they don't mean that in a militant sense at all. It really relates to the courage that it takes <clears throat> to really face what is and to stay with that, um, whether it's a difficult emotion or a difficult political social condition. Um, <clears throat> it took me a long time to kind of understand that. It was really turned off by that term at first. But, um, you know, with more practice, you understand that it, it does take courage. And the other thing I would comment on is, it seems what you're describing is the difference between, um, that the, the main criterion <clears throat> behind all of this is doing no harm and doing things for the benefit of all beings. And so when those are the criteria, it's not about how we just personally how we feel, not that that isn't important, but that's not the bottom line. Mm -hmm. And so, sometimes I find that helpful because I can get too stuck in kind of micromanaging and micro <clears throat> and analysis, if you will. And um, and especially in this time when I've been listening so much and learning a lot, just feel like I'm in the classroom all the time. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> it feels really good. Yeah. <clears throat> One of the, there's a, a, a metta practice that I use a lot that came out of 9-11. And one of the phrases is, may I find forgiveness or may we find forgiveness for the inevitable harms we bring to one another. And I just really um, hold that in my heart. May we all find forgiveness for the inevitable harms we bring to one another. And I too have struggled a bit with the warrior imagery and, um, but under, you know, it's, it is that, that sort of um, really being, being ready to um, face your demons in a way. I, um, at the very, somewhere earlier on before, before the, what I'm calling the second wave of what, what's going on, um, I was listening to uh, Tibetan teaching on the um, feminine deities. Mm -hmm. And, and um, at that time, I was full of a lot of fear around the seclusion and not knowing what to do. And it was just in my body. I had the awareness, but it was really deep. And feeling, I don't know, there was something wishy about it. I wasn't realizing that, but she, uh, the, that evening, uh, Vajra Yogini was introduced, the, the red, fiery, fierce goddess of compassion. I, in my Theravada training, had never been introduced to a force like that. And we did a guided meditation, and I felt myself, through the meditation, move from a puddle of victim, <laughs> kind of a passive absorption in grief, you know, that kind of just being, yeah, taken up by it. Mm -hmm. And I could feel what you're talking about, this fierce, like the fierce mother, this fierce energy coming. And this particular deity stands on um, 
the, a sun disc over a human corpse, and it's actually our own corpse that she's standing on, the way they described it. And I had that sense of, bring it on. I could feel the fire, and I was standing on my own corpse, not as a dead person, but as all the debris that gets in the way of freedom. You know, every, the samsara, the habits, the fear, it just, you know, so that was really powerful. And I've been bringing that to mind lately because in this second period now, facing this disruption, this beautiful kind of disruption, beautiful and terrible about race and conversations I didn't think in my lifetime I would ever hear go public. Mm -hmm. I can't even believe it. But I'm noticing um, kind of the words suck it up and not in a forcing through anything, but the mm -hmm. sense of suck it up. There's a reason to be strong right now. You need your fierce energy. Um, and it's been really helpful to keep me, um, yeah, steadfast. A friend of mine has been using that word also. Step, may you be steadfast. So. Yeah, that's a great word. Often in equanimity practice, steadfastness is the uh, one of the qualities of equanimity of really being able just to um take whatever whatever comes your way and not be not be broken by it talking um Aya Chandasiri once a years a hundred years ago I had an interview with her and I was grieving about my my mother's death I was a puddle again just lost and and she said right in the middle of the interview like the sword coming at me um well she said you don't want to get lost in the drama and I thought it was the most cold-hearted unempath I, I just had all this judgment but you know it went right to Mm -hmm. I have gone back to that so many times. It pulled me out of like cold water, it pulled me out of that morass of whatever. Mm -hmm. And like, um, it brought courage to the floor. I mean, I'm not going to be, this is good for nothing to be lost in that. It was beyond grief. It was, yeah. I, I know that sometimes, um, and that you know one clings to grief and clings to loss um as a way of um i had done it once long time sort of complicated story i'm not going to get into but i have had the experience where i was clinging to grief and a loss because i thought it made me a better person not to let go of it i thought that showed what a good person i was that I couldn't get over this. And, um, and when I, someone pointed that out to me, it was very sobering that I just kept feeding it because my sense of myself as a good person was really tied up with that sense of loss. So you know, looking for where our sense of self comes into play so often is just really, really helpful like you know is this is this a drama that um I, i've just gotten caught up in the drama which is so easy for all of us i mean it's 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 just such an easy easy thing what we're clinging to again and then this would go back to wisdom about you know what is the precise cause of my suffering right now and often you know that's really to do with some particular sense of self and it's really hard sometimes to to look at that and to see that clearly and see how it's um how that's that's functioning When you mentioned earlier, Patrice, about as white people, we want to be helpers. Um, that really provoked something for me. Um, and, and that motivation to want to help comes out of a sense of doing as opposed to being. And 
which means then it comes from a very fixed view that we think we know what is needed. When perhaps the courageous thing uh, is to deeply listen, just be still, whether we're still with whatever is here or still with whatever it is that's arising for me. Um, and, and the other thing about this parami that um, comes up for me is language is so difficult um, because we each have so much extra stuff around a word in terms of what that word means when we think of courage, when we think of valor, when we think of fierceness, when we think of warrior, when the courageous thing may simply be to move to that place of just being with what's really here for me in this situation that's driving this wanting to do, wanting to fix, wanting to cling to this fixed view that I know what's needed, as opposed to coming inside and am, am I contracted mm -hmm. or am I expansive? And if I'm contracted, it's a time for listening whether I'm listening to what's here and staying with that investigation. When you started out talking about investigation, investigation really leads to the quality of courage and what that means or the quality of valor, the quality qualities that are connected with this parami. Um, and it may be bringing tenderness. You know, it may be when I'm, when I'm contracted and I'm feeling really compelled and I wanna do and I wanna fix, I'm lost. <laughs> you know, when there's something underneath that that I'm scared or there's some other emotion or way of relating that's unsatisfactory. Mm -hmm. And it's so important for me to stop, to pause. I, I, it makes me think of um, a Pema Chodron quote that I often use when I uh, lead an all-day retreat in MBSR. And she talks about staying. Um, discursive mind, stay. Are you hungry? Stay. Am I angry? Stay. Just stay, no matter what's here. And it really speaks to that just being with what's here without adding anything. And it's only, I, I discover um, that it's only by going into that investigation that I can just be. And the wisdom of the courage or whatever kind of action might emerge really needs to come from that being as opposed to that essence of clinging and doing and fixing and knowing mm -hmm. um, as opposed to responding with heartfulness. And, and I think about one of the images that really speaks to this for me in all of the unrest that has unfolded are the police officers that have taken a knee to the crowds. And that just really speaks volumes to heartfulness and I don't know and I am open, teach me. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's what comes up for me. And, and, and maybe some of this comes through these filters because I'm a fierce person. <laughs> and for me, tenderness and stillness is so important to lean into, um, to let go of that known way of relating that keeps the wheel spinning if that makes sense. That's what's Absolutely. And, and, and that idea of, you know, having the um, tenacity to do that, to just sit, to just be, to um, bring that um, energy to, to doing that. Yes. And that was the other word that, that was loaded for me because many of us, when we think of the word energy, we think of energy up here and it's mm -hmm. going, going, going when it may be real, deep, low, quiet, present, listening energy. So 
Yeah. That's helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. And I did want to talk about um, what you talked about, the spiritual bypass. That That's really, really helpful. And when I first started on this path, which is a while ago, but um, in a different tradition, Tibetan, mm -hmm. I, I didn't, I thought, you know, I didn't get, I, I could see that I thought that there was, that they were, I'm sorry, I'm not saying it right. I thought that's what was expected, was the spiritual bypass. And so the, it, it really, um, was a stumbling block for me. And, and then coming to the Theravada, the insight meditation tradition, it seems so much more uh, central to this tradition that we stay, that we sit with it, that we learn the difference between what you were talking about, uh, when it's not skillful to stay with something and when it is still skillful. I mean, I guess that's an individual mm -hmm. thing to learn. I'm not sure yet because I still have that old mentality need to have a happy face on. So learning the differences is definitely, uh, I need to be more discriminating about it. I think also what you said about courage is so helpful because these conversations that we have with others um, who don't have our point of view, it takes a lot of courage. Um, I don't even know, you know, my first feeling is like, oh, I don't want to have this conversation. I can't do it. Mm -hmm. And what you were saying is, you know, no, no, we need to be brave and in the best of our ability with the right intentions to have these conversations and not turn away. Because in a way we're turning away from ourselves or abandoning on ourselves, abandoning ourselves, if we're not able to sit with it and have these conversations. So thank you, thank you very much for what you said. Oh, you're so welcome. Yeah, and in terms of having conversations with other people, one of the things that was so helpful to me many years ago, I read Harriet Lerner, who was a um, psychiatrist at the Menninger Clinic, wrote a number of books for women, and the first big one was called The Dance of Anger. But um, she talked about how when you really want change, um, and you're in a relationship with someone else, um, and even if a really dysfunctional dynamic, um, when you want that relationship to change, um, you should be prepared for the other person to sort of push every single button to bring out every piece of sort of psychological artillery that that person has because it is so often easier to stay in a dysfunctional relationship where you know what the parameters are than to try something that is really different. So her advice was always, you know, if you want to uh, do things differently with your mother or your son or whatever, <clears throat> your spouse, um, you need to do that at a time when you are really kind of, the word that you use now is resourced, and, um, and you really have to be in it for the long run because this person is going to do everything possible to um, reinstate the original dynamic. And although that's particular to relationships, um, I think it has, I found it's had a wider application for me that I try not to get into conversations unless I'm feeling kind of resourced about and willing to listen, really willing to listen and having curiosity about the other person's experience. Um, if I'm not willing to get into it, I often say, and this is a great line that I have found has done a lot of, a lot of good for me. I say to people, really, that's interesting. That's just not my experience. And sort of walk away. Um, so I don't feel like I've kind of given in, but it's, it's a, a great line. But, you know, having difficult ex uh, conversations with people, I think, you know, the other part is really, as, as Nancy was talking about, sort of deep listening within ourselves, listening to other people and really finding out more about it. And then having the, um, the energy and the willingness to pursue it. And I know a lot of people in Dharma circles um, 
have done work around nonviolent communication, which is just brilliant. And I think that you know it's really useful for all of us to to do that as a way of learning how to listen for the needs of other people and to listen in a way that really is no harm to ourselves <clears throat> and no harm to to others. And it does take some courage to do that and and some tenacity to do it. You know, to have the energy to do that is really challenging. Um, thank you, Patrice. Um, presently, I, I feel I'm sitting with some paradox of um, a few things. Um, it was uh, serendipitous that I've been reading a book by Norman Fisher. I just like Norman Fisher, and it is about the parameters. And in his translation, it's um, a joyful effort. And in the Turgar tradition that we're in, seems to be translated that way too. Um, and and that, that is of interest. And, and, and for Lorna and myself, when we've been hearing some of the things and we discuss some of our own experiences, in part of the paradox for me is, is understanding what it's like to be marginalized. Um, but what, what is also difficult is the deep listening that, that I'm, I'm, I have white skin, so I, I have that as a privilege. And I've traveled a lot, been around all different kinds of places. Um, and to understand what it feels like um, to be a person of color who is um, systematically and systemically abused by uh, many, in many, many areas, um, I need to deeply listen and, and, and that what I talked about on Monday and not knowing what we talked about last week is really clear. I don't know. And it's like, I, 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 I cannot really fully comprehend what that must feel like because my experience is so different. And yet on the other hand, because I've known margin of being marginalized, I can understand what it feels like in some small way. Um, and there's something that I teach with, you know, because I teach a college level literature, and there's some, a, a quotation by, um, by Terence, uh, the playwright who influenced Shakespeare, a Roman playwright, but he was Af actually an African slave who was liberated and given his freedom because he could write. And he said something so wonderful, and it was Maya Angelou who passed this on you know, when I heard her speak, um, pass this on, on to me, um, that he said, Terence said, because I am human, I can understand everything that is human. And that went very deep for me. Because I'm human, I can understand all aspects of humanity. And yet, in this one, there's some aspects that I really do not fully understand. And so that's where the deep listening comes in. Even though, as I say, I understand what it's like to be marginalized, um, to be pre having prejudice, um, but in a different kind of prejudice. In Britain, it was class prejudice. Um, I know what it's like to be in a movement where everybody's blamed because of actions of, of one or two people. I know what that's like. Um, but I don't fully know what it's like to be walking around Minneapolis now, right now, with a black skin compared to what I've just been walking around with a white skin. So it's that, that's what I mean by the paradox of it. Humility. Thank and you. The humility. Thank you. Yeah, we, we, we never know completely another person's experience, but we can know, I think we can know enough and that we we practice with you know i mean we're in in some ways there the separation you know there again this is the paradox on, on one level there are all these great separations but on another very deep dharmic level there is no separation and it's really sort of moving uh, in in our grosser daily actions. You know, we want to be really careful. Um, but we also 
know deeply, deeply that, you know, each one of us has the possibility of, of awakening. We all, we all share that. Um, we all share, um, you know, the, the need to be, um, to feel safe. I mean, there are so many things that we all, all share on this very deep visceral level. And then there are some really, really important differences that we might never completely understand. And I would really encourage people who are interested um, in this, if you have time this week and you're willing to listen to podcasts that um, on the 10% Happier podcast, Rama, uh, Lama Rod Owens um, talks mm -hmm. about difficult conversations um, among people of different racial identities. I mean, he makes this really, one of the first things he says is, no, to have a conversation, you have to have consent. You have to ask for consent. And how often people just kind of come up and want to, want to engage. So it, there are some very, very um, helpful, thoughtful, um, he's very candid, very interesting, wonderful Dharma practitioner. So if you uh, just you know, Google 10% happier and you go to the list of podcasts, um, you can, can find that there are quite a few um, about race. It's also very interesting. Um, Dan Harris, the person who uh, is the um, interviewer, he said you know, that they've had, I mean, they've, all the, the people are, you know, everybody is, has been interviewed. And he said, it's really interesting. You know, they're always tracking their numbers. When the topic is race, or there is um, you know, a teacher of color, their numbers go down in terms of how many people listen to the podcast. And um, Sebene Selassie, who is a, a Dharma teacher at IMS, who is Ethiopian, and she said she is, has run a Dharma center. And she said, you know, it was inevitable at a Dharma center. If the visiting teacher was white male and had an academic pedigree, the Donna just rolled in. And for people who, uh, she said, and you know, if it was a woman and a woman of color, likely to be much less Donna. So it's just interesting how, um, you know, in our own uh, communities, um, we we see that uh, operating too, and um, so I, I think that's that's all. Uh, those are all things that we should should think about and and consider, and you know the, the sort of um, and we're, to get back to spiritual bypass just for a closing moment, you know that that. Um, it's the, the sort of talk about the, the messy, the messy mundane world, that that seems to be, um, you know, that's not why people come to a spiritual community. That's not why they're listening to a spiritual podcast. You know, they want to, um, want to hear something, something very different sometimes. So it's just really, really worth, um, thinking about. And, and reflecting on it. So I, I hope that um, this is um, a week where you get to um, work with, with courage and with energy and um, stick with it um, because as Sylvia said, the only time is now. And um, I look forward to connecting with you um, next week uh, when we'll talk about patience. So, um, so thank you all for for being here. Is there anything they want to say? Last words or anything? Okay, well then, thanks everyone. I hope to see you next week.